My talk is plants, a conservation blind spot, and that's a little takeoff on a conservation hotspot, uh, which we don't see very often for plants. So um, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, theme of art and science, and I'm going to begin with the art of the plants out there on the landscape and then go to the science of the plants and what we're working on. And I want to begin by going through several photographs fairly quickly from the landscape level of these native plant communities to the micro level that show the beauty of the Carrizo Plains National Monument in California during the 2017 super bloom. And I just want to repeat that <laughs> the American iconic American landscapes are the native plant communities that are out there that we so often forget or think about as just backdrop. Uh, I think that when, when looking at these beautiful photographs, and I must say, I did not take these photographs. These photographs were taken by a, a fellow named uh, Bob Wick, who works for the Bureau of Land Management out in um, our natural uh, conservation lands. But in looking at them, these are our landscape paintings of native plant communities that can take years, even decades, to occur. And I want to take you into this landscape closer and closer to understand what we really need to see to ensure that the American landscapes that we love continue to look like our native landscapes wherever they may be in the 50 states. So as I said, this is Carrizo Plains. And some of those different colors are made up from, this is Facelia ciliata, or Great Valley Facelia. This is uh, tick seed, or Coreopsis uh, caliopsidia. The next one probably folks know is uh, the Escholtzia californica, California poppies. And unfortunately, not all of our plants, native plants, or our um, uh, native plant communities are as beautiful as these. But below the ground, the true heroes of the landscape, and you'll see I'm following in my friend here, Nornists, um, are the seeds. So these are the purple flowers, the Facelia ciliata, and these are the seeds that have been laying dormant in the soil there for years, potentially decades. This is the yellow Coreopsis caliopsida. They're just waiting in the soil for the right moisture, the right temperature to occur, and then they're ready to germinate. I'm just getting through one more. This is the wild uh, carrot or rattlesnake weed. And basically these, fo these folks, listen to me, <laughs> these seeds, I do think they're my friends. Um, <laughs> These are what are producing those massive displays of flowers. But I found uh, an interesting quote from George O'Keefe that says, nobody sees a flower really, it's so small. We haven't time, and to, take to, to see takes time, like to have a friend takes time. And because all of those plants are not as beautiful as the California poppy or as visually um, uh, appealing as this entire hillside, mountain of um, the super bloom, most people, I mean, Georgia had it right. They don't see plants. They're a backdrop to a lot of things. And um, there have been studies that have been conducted that show that plant blindness does exist in us humans. Um, but what I really would like to um, talk about here is the numbers that show plant blindness exist in a very real way across this country. Um, there are over 1,660 species listed under the Endangered Species Act in the United States alone, and 56% of those are plants, yet plants receive less than 4% of the recovery dollars that are uh, spent on uh, those species. Uh, the U.S. spends less than 5% of their research dollars on plants, which includes not only your agricultural research, your environmental research, and your biological research. And the part that is really apparent to me as a federal government agency uh, botanist, and, and if you look at what 
The federal government manages, we manage a, a, almost a third, about 29 to 30 percent of the land mass in the United States is managed for you by the federal government agencies. And botanists are outnumbered one to 20 by wildlife biologists, and yet it is the land and these landscapes that we are supposed to be managing. So that's the end of my pretty slides. We're gonna go move on to, this is uh, Hurricane Florence, pictured um, in 2018. Nine out of the 10 most costly hurricanes in the US have occurred since 2004. Four out of the 10 happened in 2017 and 2018, or 2018. So Harvey, Maria, Irma, and Florence. When I looked up what the cost of those hurricanes are, the, the top five have cost the United States almost $500 billion. So that's just one extreme weather event that plants have to deal with, or we have to deal with. Um, this is the next ugly photo, but it's a, I, I work for the Bureau of Land Management and we're in knee deep in wildfires every year and the fire season's getting longer. Since 2013, wildfires in the United States have cost at least one billion in damages each. Wildfires cost the US 24 billion in 2018. They cost 18.4 billion in 2017. We're seeing an increase in um, the number of wildfires and we're also seeing an increase in the intensity of these wildfires, which is not good for the native plant communities. So what is the, what's the connection here? Um, I think all of us are well aware of the torrential mudslides that are happening this week, this month in California. And really the best defense against these extreme weather events such as hurricanes, wildfires, mudslides, are the native plant communities. Healthy, diverse native plant communities are far more productive and far more resilient to these weather events than are our non-native invasives. But as Robin talked about uh, earlier, we don't have the opportunity or the ability to get the number of seeds or the amount of seeds that we need to work on the scale that we have to work to restore after wildfires or to um, uh, reclaim after um, various other weather events. Um, and so what I wanna talk to you about is all natives are not equal. And this is a, um, a graph and, and I just want you to focus here on Glens Ferry, Idaho, okay? This is Artemisia tridentata subspecies Wyomingensis or Wyoming big sagebrush. And I don't know how many of you in the room have heard about the endangered sage grouse, but it depends upon that massive blanket of sagebrush communities across the West. And it's really important for the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, because we are the managers of 50% of the remaining, or most of the remaining 50% of the habitat. So this is a study that was started in 1987, and I can remember that easily because that's my, when my daughter was born. And this was a study that was done in Idaho, we had a, um, and I didn't do this study, this was uh, done out of Idaho Fish and Game and the Forest Service, and they were trying to figure out whether they took seed from across the, we of, of the Wyoming Big Sage, from across the Western United States, they planted it in three what we call common garden studies. And so one was in uh, Utah, one was in Idaho here, and one was in uh, Oregon. The one in Utah, ended up being um, the site of a subdivision outside Salt Lake City. So we don't have that information anymore. But what this slide shows you is that not all natives are equal, no matter whether it's the same species or not. So in my agency where we manage a tenth of the United States land mass, if we've got a wildfire in Nevada, we can't use material that has been sourced out of Montana or Canada or somewhere up north. And most gardeners get that, but the seed that is available to us has been 
cultivated cultivars. And I just want you to see that in 2010, this, this, this slide was somebody going back to this location every five years. And the first five years that they went back, everything looked fine. We had 100% survival. After 10 years, they came back and they were like, hmm, we need to be a little bit concerned about this. It took them 23 years to recognize that the only seed from this Wyoming big sagebrush from across the West that had 100% survivability was the seed that was sourced from that place. And the same is true for the work that they had done in um, Oregon. Um, we don't have the site anymore from Utah. So what you've got here is survival, or the lack of survival, um, of most of the seed sources for that species that were you know, used or were from all these different places, and literally from Arizona north up through Montana and Wyoming, you can't take the same species just because, or the seed from the same species just because it's the same species, because it's really not. All of these species have acclimated or evolved in the area that they have grown. And so taking it from Montana and trying to put it down into the Great Basin of Nevada isn't going to work. Um, and this is just one of those studies. So this is, this is an issue that we as the federal land managers are in. We're, we're spending $50 million sometimes in a year buying seed. And we're getting the wrong seed and we're putting the wrong seed out there. Um, so what I want to talk about here is the national seed strategy, because I had a, a, a director that came up to me and said, Peggy, why are they telling me that the seeds, that the native seeds aren't working? And I said, they're not working because they're not native. They're not native to that area. So it, it's really important for us to recognize that the seeds that they have evolved in a place are the ones that are going to work the best. Um, so we... My director and 12 other agents, federal agencies, developed a national seed strategy to identify the work that we needed to do and to start bringing a focus to this because, as Doran said, it is mostly um, crop wild relatives and um, seeds that are, that are um, commodities that we pay attention to. We have not really paid attention to what's out there on the on the ground. Uh, and so I just want to quickly go over this. There's copies of this out in, on the um, table out front. If folks want to talk about it later, we can. But quickly, the four goals that we set up were the national assessment, which Robin talked about, um, conducting research on the how to grow these seeds, most people know how to grow corn, tomatoes, squash, all of those kinds of seeds, but nobody here in the United States has really done the kind of work that we need to do to grow crops where we don't want to get rid of all the genetic diversity within these species and seeds. We want the genetic diversity to remain there, and really we want it to remain there because of climate change, and we don't know what it is that we need to be using in the next 20 to 50 years to restore these lands. So we have a lot of research to do. We've got, uh, we want to take that research and give it to the land managers, interpret it for them. So there's a lot of communication that needs to happen and decision tools that we can make the science easy for the land managers in these agencies. I just want to talk a little bit about the seeds of success. This shows you what we've done in the past uh, 17 or 18 years. Um, I know it says 17, but it really this data is for the 18. And basically, you see a lot of it's out west because we have made over 24,000 seed collections of these native species. The unique taxa are up at about 5,500. Uh, the genera that we've collected, 1150. Um, the interesting thing is that we've gotten material out of 93 eco-regions, and we've got representation of species from 43 states. And unfortunately, that southeastern part is where we're lacking. And I was just at a meeting last week and discussing that with somebody. And, um, you know, that's where all the extreme hurricanes are coming. So we do have to get after that. Um, and it's probably going to be something that will be developed soon. Um, I know I'm probably get it, getting over, but I just want to show you, this is sort of a, a collage of what needs to happen. When Hurricane Sandy hit, 
the northeast part of this country, there was a request for a million dune stabilizing beach grasses. And New York City, that has a native plant nursery and has done collections, they had realized about two weeks before Hurricane Sandy that they had not done any collecting on the dune stabilizing beach grass. And so they went and collected it. But you don't get from a small collection to a million plugs to put out on, on dunes uh, in any short amount of time. It would take them five years to do it. So I just kind of want to show you, I'm using an East Coast example of some of the things that have happened. We got a grant from the Department of Interior to develop a Seeds of Success program in the East. We worked with New England Wildflower Society, New York City Parks and Rec, University of North Carolina Botanical Garden, and we set up teams of collectors that went from North Carolina north, and they did a, an inordinate, I think they collected over 2,500, made over 2,500 different uh, seed collections from maybe something like 11 states. And that was done so that we can get back out there and restore these native plant communities in the mid-Atlantic and north. Um, with the appropriate seed that wasn't available. And I think that's, this is the, this is the end of it. I'm taking you back over to the most um, extraordinary uh, uh, super bloom. And I wish every part of our country had a super bloom that would educate and excite Americans to understand our native flora. Our native plant communities are the best defense, as I said, against weather events, extreme weather events, and we need to invest in them. They are the green infrastructure. Thank you.